What makes a track licensable? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Hello and welcome to the Modern Composer Podcast. My name is Stephen Keach and I'm a composer who wants to help you write sync ready music so you can get film and TV placements, create passive income, and build a sustainable career in music. In this episode, we're going to be talking about what makes a track licensable. We're going to talk about mood, structure, genre, and lyrics, if that's something that you do. So stay tuned and we're going to get into it. All right, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you're finding these episodes helpful or entertaining, would you mind subscribing to the YouTube channel? Uh, Subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. It would help out a ton. And if you really want to help spread the word about The Modern Composer, then send this to a friend that you think would benefit from what is in this episode. So without further ado, let's get into it. Before we start talking about what makes a track licensable, let's talk about what I mean by that. Making a track licensable is just making it useful to a visual medium. It's generally known that music can enhance the motion of a film or a TV show or commercial. Uh, So that brings me to the first thing that I want to talk about, which is mood. So mood is just the word that we use to describe the emotion of the track, uh, whatever emotion it's going to convey. So if you go to any licensing site, you're going to see that each song is tagged with some kind of mood, like happy, sad, intense, swagger. Uh, These are incredibly important. It took me years to figure out exactly how important they are. A licensable track will have one or two clear moods through the entire thing. You don't want to be veering off to the left or to the right. You don't want to change the mood in the middle of a track. You want to keep it consistent and concise. That way people can find it. A lot of times the people who are looking for music for their productions are looking for a certain mood. They're going to go into the search bar at their favorite licensing company and type in happy or, you know, that's a general one, but you get it, inspiring or something like that. And if you throw them a curveball in your track, like you start out with a, a a part of your song that sounds sad, but then you've got a really happy chorus section, then they're probably just going to skip your track and you're going to lose the placement. So you want to keep it consistent and concise. Um, Mood is a really objective idea, but a lot of these terms are thrown around in the music licensing business, and they've started to mean specific things to music supervisors and anyone looking for music. For instance, swagger means music that's confident, but also kind of a little bit don't give a attitude. So know your moods, know what you're trying to go for before you even start writing. Now, let's talk about emotion. Uh, I love emotional music. Ever since I started writing music, I want whatever I do to make you cry. For some reason, I'm highly drawn to overly emotional music. Even the happy stuff that I write is typically drenched in emotion. You might think that that's a really good thing for sync. However, I've learned over the years that, you know, You don't want everything dripping with emotion because it can become super distracting in whatever uh, video it's in. Now, I watch a lot of YouTube and a lot of times these YouTube shorts will come up uh, that are like a a little inspirational tidbit and it has almost every time I feel like it has the interstellar soundtrack behind it. And it makes me so annoyed because what they're talking about does not match the intensity of the music. So, could we dial back the emotion a little bit to get more placements to have a little bit more of a reach? Yes. So, think of emotion like a water faucet. On the left, you have totally cold water, which is void of all emotion. And on the right, you have hot water that is basically sobbing at the piano emotion. Now, for most applications, you can go right down the middle. 
Very rarely do you need to go all the way to the left or all the way to the right. Uh, you know, start in the middle. And if you need a little bit more emotion, then you just nudge it to the right a little bit. If you need it to be a little bit colder, you just nudge it to the left a little bit. That's a really great way to think about emotion in tracks. Because very rarely do you need that, you know, sobbing, like full on beautiful moment in a licensing track. There are times when you need it, but not always. So in other words, too much emotion can be distracting from most uses. That doesn't mean you shouldn't put feeling into your music. I I honestly put feeling into everything that I do. I just try to dial back the emotion when I can. Even when it's like a happy track or a nostalgic track or whatever, just Rain it in just a little bit, and that will likely give you more placements. I can't say that I always adhere to this because, again, like I said, I love making hyper-emotional music. It's my favorite thing in the world. Uh, but, yeah. Okay, so song structure. Um, this is something that can make or break the licensability of a track. So a little story a few years ago, I had to fix a toilet in our house. And if you've ever fixed a toilet, all you have to do is go to Home Depot or Lowe's and they have a kit that will fit any toilet. You just make sure you buy the right kit and your toilet, you just install it and it fixes the leak. So that is what we're kind of trying to do with licensing music. We want to get as close as we can to exactly what the user is going to need. Um, And we do that with our structure. We want to make it as easy as possible for our editor to grab our track and drop it into their production, into their edit, chop it up, and use the parts of the song that they're going to need. So think about trailer music. Trailer music is definitely the most structure dependent placement in this business. It's a three act structure, each act kind of ascending like a staircase to a larger than life grand finale. And it's all in two minutes and 30 seconds. Now the track, when you make a trailer track, you need to make sure that it has all of the ingredients that that editor is going to need. So maybe you make the track around three minutes and 30 seconds long, but each section is going to be defined and there's going to be a clear difference between the dynamic sections. You can even see it when you look at a wave file of the track, there's going to be, uh, this is only for the YouTube watchers here, there's going to be a rise, a drop, a rise, a drop, and then a big section right? Three act structure. You're giving the editor all the tools that they need. And it's clear where you make those cuts, where you decipher those sections. So when I was in a band writing songs, you know, the typical song structure was verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end. Now, I'm not saying that you can't do that structure in licensing music. Sometimes it works, uh, but you don't need to. Um, If you're writing a vocal track, it definitely can still benefit to work off of a similar structure, maybe verse, chorus, verse, chorus, big chorus, end, um, that kind of thing. But uh, if you're writing instrumental tracks, uh, you could be a little bit more creative with your structure. As long as you are conveying three dynamic sections and as long as you are telling a story through those sections. What I mean by that is... Uh, It's clear where you're going and you're going to give different levels of energy in each section so that the editor can chop it up and use it where they need to go. Because a lot of times these things get also chopped down from two minutes and 30 seconds, not just trailer tracks, but commercials and YouTube videos and TV shows. All of those are going to get chopped up into little tiny sections, or they're going to extend one section throughout the entire video. So you want to make sure that you're able to loop sections, chop sections, and make it very evident where each section starts and where it ends. 
One thing that we can do to increase the licensability of our tracks in the structure is add a new element every four to eight bars. You don't want to be switching from little dynamic section to a huge dynamic section super quickly. You kind of want it to be a gradual increase and then a drop off and then a big hit, right? So if you can make little subtle changes every four to eight bars, it's going to keep the listener intrigued without distracting from whatever is going on in the video. Maybe it's a tambourine that comes in for eight bars and then goes away. And maybe the guitar drops out there or something like that. You kind of understand. You can kind of play around with which elements of your track are going to be in at any given time. And it's nice to switch it up every four to eight bars. So in between all these sections, you want to introduce stops, risers, filter sweeps, and whatever production tricks you can throw in there to make the transitions between each section super exciting. That is going to help with the overall transition from part to part in the video. Pay attention to YouTube videos, pay attention to commercials, pay attention to TV shows. There's there's almost always some type of transition swell or uh, exciting thing that happens uh, whenever they're using those placements or going from uh, scene to scene. Make a clear beginning and ending to every track. Make sure that those are concise and clear. So end your tracks with like a bumper or a stinger. That'll go a long way. A lot of times people will just use that bumper or stinger. Now, what is that? That's basically just like a little tag that you can add at the end of your track. Um, I kind of think about, I think it's a football theme. There's a stinger. Uh, anyway, it goes da-da-da, da-da-da. Tell me what that is. I don't. I think it's football. I don't watch a lot of football. But if you do, maybe you know. That is a stinger. Just a quick little turnaround that someone can use for like a logo or um, something like that. And sometimes that is all that they're going to use from your track. And if you add that at the end of your track, then you are going to get more placements. So one thing to note is that custom scores don't automatically make good licensing tracks. The structure is often too specific or erratic, and it needs to be reworked to be good for licensing. So a lot of times when you're writing a score like that, it's going to be uh, changing moods, time signatures, genres, just a little too quickly or a little too erratically um, because you're scoring straight to the picture. Think about an editor taking um, a stock music track and chopping that up into little pieces and moving that around. You you wouldn't want to release just that. So it's good to rework your custom tracks if you're doing scoring a short film or something like that. It's good to rework those tracks into a more palatable structure so that you can get more uses out of it. Uh, a good length of time for a licensing track, a licensable track, is between two and a half minutes and three and a half minutes. You can sometimes go over that um, if it's a particularly slow track and you need a little bit more time to develop your idea. And sometimes you can even go under it. I've had, I have a track that is 60 seconds long. It was a very concise commercial track that I did, and it has more licenses than I can count. It is probably my most licensed song. Don't feel bad if you're doing one minute long tracks. Now, I can't say that licensing companies will always take those one minute long tracks. So maybe it's better to do a longer one, but uh, sometimes they do. Um, so don't be afraid to pitch those. All right, let's talk about genre. What genre should you be writing in and what will get you the most placements? It's hard to say, it's a hard question to ask. Uh, there's room for most genres in the licensing space. When I was a staff composer, uh, one of our jobs was to tackle all the oddball genres. So that went from sea shanties to Bollywood music, and it went all over the place. We did all kinds of genres. Um, and we were a little bit of a rare case because we were on salary. Our, our pay wasn't dependent on how well our tracks did. And obviously, those more left-field genres aren't going to get as many licenses. However, 
the licensing company appreciated us making those oddball genres because it kept the client base happy. Anyone could go find whatever genre they wanted to on the platform. So if you made an odd and specific genre, a company might accept you because they need something like that to round out their catalog. However, I don't suggest starting there. Um, There are definitely some genres that will license better and would be a better place for you to start. Those include cinematic, corporate, singer-songwriter, as long as the lyrics aren't too specific. Pop rock, electro-funk, hip-hop, lo-fi, hip-hop, indie, lo-fi, indie, lo-fi, whatever you want to add at the end there. Ambient. There are so many genres that are super licensable. Now, unfortunately for me, early 2000s emo and hardcore doesn't really make the list of licensable genres, uh, which is a bummer if you know my history, because, you know, I can I can do that. Uh, although you never know what the future holds. And honestly, like I said, some of the oddball genres sometimes get you in um, or can be used by certain licensing companies. Just like I said earlier, you go to Artlist or Soundstripe, you look at what all the genre options are, and you just look through, listen, and that'll give you an idea of what is licensing really well on their platforms. You can go up to the sort. There's usually a sort button at the top of their browse feature, and you just sort by top downloaded tracks. Or you, sometimes you can sort by newer, and if you if you sort by newer, you can see what's getting accepted into the catalog. You won't necessarily see how well those tracks are doing, but you can at least see what they're looking for. So yeah, see what genres are resonating with you and what kind of music, think about what kind of music you make quickly and easily and what you feel most comfortable with and create an album in that genre. I, I don't like creating albums that have multiple genres. And I I don't even like putting out multiple genres under one moniker. I prefer to have different monikers for each genre. And you can do that. Every time you make a new genre or decide you're going to tackle, uh, you're going to go from cinematic music to indie pop, make a new moniker. And uh, you have to go through all the steps of branding that moniker, and that's something to consider. But you can make a new moniker and release music under that. So yeah, when you're first starting out, it's best to focus on one genre at a time. That way you can kind of figure out everything that you need to figure out about that genre, how to make it sound great, how to make it licensable, and all of that. Because it takes a lot of work to build new monikers and do all that stuff. Okay, lyrics. I by no mean am an expert on lyrics. I have friends that are, um, that have written so many lyric songs. I have not written that many songs with lyrics for sync. And it's something that I honestly get a little stuck on, uh, which is okay, which is why I typically will just stick to instrumental music. I prefer that. It takes a lot less time. But if you are someone who can write lyrics and you can sing, then it would be worth it to give this a shot. But here are some tips if you are going to write lyrics for your songs. Keep them broad and vague and relatable. And less is more when it comes to lyrics. You don't want to tell a story like Johnny Cash does because it really limits what your track can be used for. So you want to keep the lyrics broad vague and relatable. The lyrics should give you more of a feeling than telling a story, if that makes sense. Uh, You can get personal uh, as long as you are vague about it. You don't want to say any pronouns. You don't want to say any specific names of places or anything like that. You want to keep everything as broad as possible so that it can have a more mass appeal. So you can try like in the verses using a lot of imagery. Imagery is really, really good. Like when you're talking about landscape imagery or something like that, you can say stuff like the sky is on fire, the sun goes down, white streaks across the sky, blah, blah, blah. Those are terrible examples. Don't use those. But for the choruses, use really direct 
lines, like tags that communicate an emotion. I'm going to get it. Give me something new. The world is ours. A new day rising. Stuff like that. It's, uh, again, those are terrible examples, but you kind of get the idea. You tag something that is uh, expressing a clear emotion, but it's not too specific. Um, So here are a few topics that license really well. These aren't the only topics. You can expand on this. You can make it as personal as you want to, as long as it's broad enough. Um, But you've got togetherness, changes or changing, uh, strength, overcoming hardships, newness, like like I said before, give me something new, readiness, I'm ready, non-romantic love, uh, this is important, believe it or not, uh, love songs don't license very well unless the lyrics are vague enough to apply to any kind of love. Uh, brotherly love, love between friends, loving a pet, loving your mom, that kind of thing. Um, you don't want to get too uh, personal in that way. Um, but again, uh, less is more. It's okay if your lyrics are sparse. It's actually better that way. Um, repeat lines as much as you can without getting annoying. And uh, you don't have to write a lot of lyrics. You can leave a lot of blank space in these types of usages because, again, somebody's going to chop up your your track and make it work with their video. Also, always print an instrumental version of your track. Sometimes they use those in tandem, so they'll use mostly an instrumental track, and then at the very end, they'll tag that final chorus line or whatever it is. So make sure you're printing instrumental versions. Well, those are the basics. I could talk about this probably forever. And the reality is, is that you never really know exactly what's going to make something licensable. Some tracks have the it factor, and that's really hard to nail down. Uh, Some tracks are just that licensable uh, without following any of these rules. Um, But this is a really great um, way to start. Just kind of follow these as guidelines, not really rules. Also, push the boundaries if you want to. Figure out the rules and then just push the boundaries and do something totally crazy and off the wall and see if it works. You don't know. I mean, this is all a little bit of a trial and error situation. All right. If you have any questions about this stuff, feel free to leave it in the comments if you're watching on YouTube or just reach out to me on the Modern Composer website. That's just themoderncomposer.com. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I really hope it helps you make some super licensable music and get some big placements. If you want to kickstart your journey into licensing music, check out my course, The Sync Process Challenge. It's a five-week digital course that will take you through the entire process of creating your first licensable pitch to licensing companies. By the end of the course, you will have a three-song EP of highly licensable tracks that are ready to pitch. Right now, I have a limited number of spots available for the pre-sale at 40% off. So make sure you go reserve your spot now. Click the link in the show notes or go to themoderncomposer.com slash sync dash process dash challenge to learn more. Thank you again for listening and we'll see you in the next one.